everybody. It's Lisa S. Johnson with 108 Rockstar Guitars. And today we are going to be one-on-one -on -one with the one and only Randy Bachman, who, as you may know, B.B. Uh, King as the king of the blues, and you may know Elvis Presley as the king of rock and roll, and some of you may know that Bo Diddley is the DNA of rock and roll, but us Canadians, we love to call Randy Bachman the architect of Canadian rock and roll. And there's really good reason for that because Randy uh, started off with the Guess Who and they incorporated a lot of different sounds, jazz, blues, country, all different kinds of music to develop their own sound. He's also worked with so many lumin luminaries, um, our also very own Jeff Healy, uh, Peter Frampton, um, Oh, you know, give us some names. I mean, he's, he's Neil Young. Neil Young. <laughs> he's collaborated with so many people. Joe Bonamassa. Joe Bonamassa. That's right. Walter Trout. Walter Trout's on your new album. Yes, uh, and he played amazing. Uh, by George considering by he blew up a hotel room in Denmark to do it. Oh, really? So well, he was on tour. We're going to talk all about this album, and okay. before we get to it, though, I want to talk about the guitar that I photographed for my book, 108 Rockstar Guitars. I shot that in around 2009 time frame. Uh, I was working with my publicist at the time, Jeff Albright, who made the call to you or to your people, and your answer was, yeah, she can photograph my guitar, but she has to go to the Rock and Roll ha Hall of Fame to do so in Cleveland. That's because I didn't have it. <laughs> yeah, because it was in It, it was, was hiding there. So I arrive, I have to tell you my story, I arrive in Cleveland, and I arrive the night before because the shoot was at 8 a.m. at the Rock Hall, and I'd never been there before, because they had, we had to do it before the, the hall before opened. Before the open. Yeah, so I arrive the night before, <laughs> and I want to do a little reconnaissance, because I need to figure out where am I going, where am mm -hmm. I going to park for 8 in the morning. So I, I, on the way there, I needed to stop at the, at the pharmacy. So I go in there, and as I'm shopping around, these eyes is playing oh, overhead wow. so i'm like how cool you know i'm <laughs> i'm here to shoot randy's guitar and these eyes are playing that's neat so the next morning i go to the shoot and they pull out your 1959 gibson les paul out of the out of the case i later went in the museum and they had a little card in there out right. temporarily out of display and they bring the guitar into me and i really didn't know which guitar i was going to shoot and they bring this guitar out and it was the guitar that you wrote and recorded these eyes on Yes, an American woman. An American that was the woman? sound of American woman. Mm -hmm. That's and, right. And no time in the early BTO. So we call, the I call it. The guitar was so heavy, I couldn't play it on stage. That's funny. So I just played it sitting down in the studio. Hence, even your photo photography, people are saying this is, looks like a new guitar, except a little buckle rash on the back. There's hardly anywhere or road wear on the guitar for the number new. of years you've had that guitar yes. it looks pretty pristine yeah. that's that's very impressive but you're a huge guitar collector so yes. you treat your guitars with care so um can you tell us a little bit about how you got that guitar because it's a cool story you traded it for a mose right didn't you yes the story keeps going on it's a continued story um the continuation was two months ago i played in nanaimo bc which is where I got the guitar. Okay. We had gone there, gone to a gig. Guy had brought me the guitar. I played it at a, con a guess who church dance. And he wanted me to have the guitar. I had no money at the time. I had 72 or $75 mm -hmm. in my pocket. He wanted to do a trade. I had a Joe Mafis Moserite, which is a beautiful guitar. But the neck was too thin this way. It's for fast picking, mm. but you couldn't really bend notes and hold them and sustain them like you could on a Strat or, an, or a Les Paul. It just The neck was a little too narrow. Okay. And um, so I traded him the guitar, not knowing at the time the value of 58, 9, and 60 Gibson guitars and how they were made with a certain glue that never existed beyond that point. And the kid didn't know that either, No, I'm sure. nobody knew that. I've only read it last year in a book. Okay. That glue was some sort of animal hide and hoofs that when it hardened, it was like petrified into the wood. So the guitar has more sustain than any other. And then they stopped wow. using that glue in 61. And so um, that became a very special guitar for me. It was the sound of American Woman, which everybody hears all the time. And it sounds like a viola or a cello, but it had the Bixby on it. So um, played a gig in Nanaimo last month. The guy brought the most right. The same he guy. manages a Dairy Queen there on the highway. He has for 50 years. So the guy who was a kid who traded me this guitar, he came, I let him 
hold the copy of wow. the guitar because I have a copy of it. Now oh, that, okay. that one's a, the one was taken from uh, Cleveland to the Rock and Hall of Fame in Calgary, Alberta. Okay. So it's there in the same thing. But I pulled it out for the By George album. I had, they went across the street, took it out. I played it out solo on it on two of the By George songs on the album. Excellent. Okay, yeah. I was going to ask you that question. And I also wanted to ask you on that album, what other instruments did you use that might pertain to George Harrison that, that uh, inspired you? Um, I used a couple of George Harrison guitars. The, you know, what you call them his guitars, but... They were everybody's. They were country gentlemen, a rock jet, those kind of things mm -hmm. that he used on specific songs. But let me, if I, if I can sure. go back to yep, the Les Pauls. Do. Mm -hmm. The guy who came to my concert, then. What was his name? Do you remember? I okay. can't even the remember. Kid. We'll call him the I'll, kid. I'll look it up in here later. It's okay. Dairy Queen. <laughs> they were abandoned in Nanaimo, BC, which you probably never heard of. Of course, I'm from Canada, bro. Oh. Well, Dana crawls from there. Okay, okay. That, that's of a big yeah. that's a big claim to fame. Um, they're in a band called the Contours. I think it begins with a C. Okay. They're a drummer, a sax player, and three guitars. They don't even have a bass. Nobody even wants a bass. <laughs> they go to a music store in Nanaimo, which basically sold reeds for saxophones and things for trumpets. There was no guitar store there, but because of the music store, they got them to order right from the Gibson factory, three Les Pauls. The three Les Pauls come. The band breaks up. I get one guitar. The other guitar, the guy goes to UCLA, needs money, pawns it. It gets bought by Joe Walsh, gives it to Jimmy Page. It becomes Jimmy Page's Led Zeppelin guitar. No The other way. guy leaves Nanaimo, goes to London School of Economics, is starving, sells it on Denmark Street. It gets bought by Keith Richards, who then trades it, it plays it for many years, and then trades it to Mick... Jones? No, in the, uh, the guy who played hung, the guitar player, Mick... Honky Tonk Woman. Mick Taylor. Mick Taylor, okay. So in, Mick in Taylor songs. plays it on Honky Tonk Woman. So there's these three Les Pauls from Nanaimo, that one's the American woman, one's Keith Richards, I think he played it on Satisfaction, and then... Uh, Mick played it on um, Honky Tonk Women, and then Jimmy Page's Les Paul. So Incredible. you could document these guitars and go and get a picture. It's the greatest guitar story of all time. And get the three guitars together. Get Page and me and that would be Mick brilliant. Taylor well, or you know, Keith I'm, Richards. I'm working on volume two. Of, I've of got my... pictures of them all with it. They're all on the internet. I'll okay. give you this guy's name from the Dairy Queen. Okay. You should look up this story and, this and contact kid, the Dairy guy. Dairy Queen kid is the guy you originally traded your... He's in the band, and he brought the other guys in the band. These guys are all there. Incredible. It's like amazing. Wow. They sent me pictures There's of There's some them. kind of cosmic weaving going there is. on in there. Yeah. That is for sure. Um, so I have to tell you the RSMP story. Yeah. So about, I don't know, two or three years ago, I get this phone message. Hello, Miss Johnson. This is the RCMP calling. And we have a package here that you sent to Randy Bachman. Can you please give us a call? And I'm like, what the heck is wow. going on here? Actually, they didn't even tell me the Ronnie Bachman part. They just said, please contact us. And I'm thinking, what did I do? Yeah. I'm in trouble with the RCMP? Yeah. yeah. So I call them up. I go, yes, this is Lisa Johnson. They said, yes, well, we have this package here for you for Randy Bachman. I said, well, how would it get to you? He said, well, apparently this was turned in from an airport, an airplane. Uh, a passenger must have had it on the plane and they left it on the plane. What would you like us to do with it? Because my address was in there. There was a letter in there oh. and uh, it had my phone number. And so I said, well, can you please forward them to Randy Bachman then? Yeah. Because his, your address was also in there. And they said, okay, we'll do. So they sent them. So I wondered if you ever got the prints. My manager had taken that back to his office, I think to get copied. Okay. Left it on the overhead on Air Canada. They contacted me and sent it to me. I'm never giving it to him again. I've got it at my <laughs> so you've house. You've got them. He's never getting them again. You tried he, to give them to him. Just, they were such beautiful shots. They well, were like real works of art. I mean, some of the angles on the guitars, you know what I mean? They just weren't dead on guitars. They were like... I wasn't sure if you saw created. them. Beautifully created, yes. That's the, the headstock. Yes. Then we have... This is... I love to get detail shots. That's and great. it's just like showing the silhouette of of a you know f human form female body and your bigsby right tailpiece and that was the I one love he liked this shot that's yeah. a fabulous shot this is beautiful 
And this one here is the one that That's I used. That's also fantastic. I, it shows the grain and the burst. Yeah. And, and well. I thought it was a factory Bigsby, but the, the kid did put the Bigsby on. They did at the music store. He brought me the bill. They put the Bigsby on for $45. It cost him $85. The guitar cost him $287. And did I read somewhere now it's valued at about a million dollars? Over a million dollars, yeah. yeah. It's insured a million at the dollar museum. guitar. Wow. And look at the beautiful grain on there and just pristine quality. One little nick right there. Yeah. So I made a bunch of prints for you. So That's you, the buckle rash. You have I fired them. a roadie over that. I came on stage once, BTO, who's playing my guitar, and he lifts it up like he's rocking, and he's got this gigantic belt buckle. And I said, his name was Weas Greg. I said, Weasel, the back of my guitar. And he goes, oh, yeah, sorry. And that was there from the his <laughs> buckle, or else it would be perfect. Well, you got a story out of it. And here you got the serial number. Yes. It's an unusual serial number. 90319. And it's got this space right there. So that's Well, a I think that shows early. it's 59. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe the 319th Gibson made, not Les Paul. They didn't make that many. Probably the 319th Gibson made in 59. And this is a surprise I brought what you. What is that? Because when you collaborated with Jeff Healy on the Heavy Blues album, yeah. Uh, you did the Bo Diddley stomp. You kind of open with that yes, Bo yes. Diddley stomp in yes. that song, yeah. uh, Confessing... Confessing to the Devil. With the Devil. Well... This is one of Bo Diddley's very early guitars wow. that he built himself. It's called the Get Drum Guitar because he put this MIDI drum player in there and that way he could sound like a full he band. He was a maniac. I played uh, one of his last shows when they opened the Gretsch Museum in Savannah, Georgia for Fred Gretsch. Cool. So I go down there. Bo Diddley's in the hospital. They had cut off his right leg oh, or his toes because he has diabetes. Yeah. They wasn't getting circulation there. So we thought he wasn't going to come. God bless the guy. He comes in an ambulance <laughs> with his son who puts him in a wheelchair and his foot's bandaged up. I've already done a set on stage and other couple of other Gretsch guys like Brian Setzer and stuff have been there and Bo Diddley comes in and he's got the rectangle guitar and so I'm sitting out front to watch him and the orange Gretsch I played is on a stand and he says, who dat? Yep. Who dat guitar? And I go, it's me. Get up here. And I go, what? So I went up and I played with him all his songs, which I knew backwards and forwards. And at the end, he handed me his guitar. It had to weigh 50 pounds. Yeah. Because in it, he had put Was a it? phaser pedal, a flanger pedal, the tremolo pedal. <laughs> There's batteries in this guitar. That's why he played it sitting down all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but I first met him. I played the Seattle Pop Festival in 1969 with the Guess Who. And Bo Diddley was on there and Chuck Berry and Led Zeppelin and 10 years after. And wow. it was just incredible. That's why you're the architect of yeah. Canadian yeah. rock and roll. <laughs> you've played with so many greats and you've uh, created so many. You produced Trooper. Uh, yeah. You create, I think they're due for the Hall of Fame next year. They at the Junos sure in Canada, are. Yeah. Absolutely. They're still Canada's ultimate party band. Raise a little hell. They played at my high school and when I was growing up. And we're here for a good time. Up. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I grew up in Penticton, B.C. in Edmonton, oh. Alberta. Yeah. Both I'm of playing those. Rock the Lake this summer. You should come back there. I might. I just might do that. I think it's in August. Okay. Kelowna, Penticton, Rock the Lake. I'm doing Peach it. Fest. Okay. Yeah. Peach Fest. So now you were influenced by Lenny Bro. Yes. That's how you got your jazz, finger style jazz. Well, my first sound. introduction to guitar was seeing Elvis on Ed Sullivan and who backed him, who was Scotty Moore, right. who played this hybrid finger style of Merle Travis, Chad Atkins. And then there was a guy in Winnipeg called Ray St. Germain, who was kind of like our Elvis, big black hair guitar. And who backed him up was the guy who was going out with his, his sister, Lenny Bro. Okay. Who was about 16. I was 15 at the time. And I go and watch this Elvis guy play. I mean, singing That's All Right, Mama, and Johnny Cash and Ray Price and all that. And I'd see this young guy with black hair with this big orange Gretsch playing guitar like I felt Scotty Moore played. And um, they played outside a parking lot every Saturday in Winnipeg selling used cars. It was called the CKY Caravan, which was a radio station there. Okay. And they'd give out donuts and coffee. And we're, we're now showing everybody the new Thunderbird or the new whatever uh, car that was out. And coming on here, the CKY Caravan with Hal Lone Pine, who's a guy that dressed like Roy Rogers, a white shirt with fringes and a hat. Okay. Betty Cody and Hal Lone Pine Jr. Well, this was the family. It was the Bro family. Lenny Bro was Jr. His father was Hal Lone Pine Sr. His mother was Betty Cody. It's like Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, made up mm. names. Because Roy Rogers' <laughs> real name was not Roy Rogers. Right. And um, so that's where I met Lenny Bro. 
And I said, I didn't say I want. When I met him, I said, I need to play like that. And he went, whoa, you need to play that way? And I said, I need to play that way. Where do you live? He said, I don't live anywhere. We just came to town. We live in a trailer. You know, huh. travel in a trailer. Yeah. <clears throat> I saw him two weeks later. He said, we moved to a place in Garden City in Winnipeg. And here's my address. And I went, wow. I have two girlfriends that live right across the street. I went to school with two uh, twins, okay. uh, Karen and Carol. And uh, I would go to the house every day for lunch. Her mom would make us lunch. We'd go back to school because I lived too far away from the school. And so I went to their house for lunch every day. And when they went back to school in the afternoon, I'd go across and knock on Lenny Bro's door, go into his house. He'd be sitting there with an Elvis or Chad Atkins or Merle Travis record. And then later, Barney Kessel and Howard Roberts and Tal Farlow and everything else. Jeez. And just watch what he was doing. And I developed a phonographic memory from him. You listen to it, you sing it in your head, then you can play it. And I kind of got all those influences of... I think I think I could say I have good taste where you play and you can leave a space. You know what I mean? You yeah. you talk in in a rhythm and you leave a space. Just like a comedian. You've got to tell a joke and let the people laugh. Sure. Or you're stepping on their laughter. They don't want to laugh as long. So you, you kind of learn what to play and what not to play. And I kind of learned, and I think, guitar etiquette from him. But he was he'd been playing since he was five. Hmm. His parents made him quit school and he was 10 and a half. And he played professionally in their band. He was there. Chet Atkins, Merle Travis. How unusual. So when you're 15 and stuck in school, you idolize this kid who was able to quit when he was 10. Yeah. All he wanted to do was quit school and play guitar. My parents made me finish school. But then I realized Lenny Bro couldn't add or subtract. He could hardly write his name on a check, on a checkbook. He was kind of illiterate in a way. He could read a little bit, but he was like 20 hours a day, solid guitar. Hmm. But a great influence on me. But you got the great influence, and then you did finish school. You struggled with it a little bit. You had to repeat some grades and stuff like that. Well, I repeated grade 10 and 11 because when my report card came at the end of the year, I had missed 135 afternoons. Oh, dear. Going to Lenny's house. That's how many <laughs> af afternoons. I, I'd actually th go there and wake him up. It would be like noon or 1 o'clock. I'd go and wake him up. He would say, well, just play my records. And he would have a, a bath, sit in the bathtub and relax. And he'd come out and do his nails because he had these incredible nails, like mm -hmm. flamenco nails. And um, as he got into jazz, he taught me a lot of, of jazz stuff that I was able to write. She's Come Undone and do Looking Out for Number One and then turn his song Blue Collar, play all this pretty much recycled Lenny Bro stuff who's basically combining Howard Roberts and Tal Farlow and Barney Kessel and, you know, Joe Pass and all those guys. It's just so beautiful. I put beautiful. that in rock and roll every once in a yeah. while. Other guys played blues licks. I played Chuck Berry. And in between, I put jazz, which was my big influence because blues is just stretching rock and roll. Jazz was like a whole different vocabulary. Which gave your bands a completely different sound from other rock and roll bands at the yeah, time. Yeah, at the time, it was pretty mm -hmm. strange. Now I look back and hear some of those records. The other bands that were out then aren't getting any airplay. And all over Canada, I hear looking up for number one on Blue Collar. Mm -hmm. I've had guys like Roy Buchanan, George Benson coming saying, we're in Detroit, man, we heard Blue Collar and we cranked it up and figured, who is this great jazz artist on a rock station in mm -hmm. the W4 in Detroit? And it was back when Turner Overdrive was a rock band. It was like the greatest <laughs> thing to hear from a rock band playing jazz. Well, it was beautiful to hear and by George, by Bachman, you know, the jazz tune. I think it's the second track. Yes. Um, what is it? If I Needed uh, Someone. Yeah. And it is so beautiful. In fact, what I thought when I first heard it was... This That's is got two Lenny Bro runs in it. Cool. See, I'm not familiar with Lenny Bro's work, oh. so I w didn't recognize that. Well, every time that, there's a jazz lick, it was, if I needed okay. someone, if I needed, do 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 and then we sing again, so. Okay. Well, what I thought was really brilliant about the opening of that song was how I felt like you're kind of on top of the future and the youth culture right now because it sort of sounds like a chill house It opening. is chill acid jazz kind of thing. Yeah. And the chords are really weird chords which I've never played before in guitar. That's very hard to play in guitar. That intro, that da 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 mm -hmm. Very hard to play on guitar. Well, I love that opening. And sing at the opening. same time. It, it's, just, it's just awesome. Thank you. How that sounds. And I feel like the, the youth generation are going to tap into that and hopefully tap into your older music yeah. as well by listening to that. Um, also, you start off the album with a sitar. And I was wondering who was playing that on your, your original song, um, Between You're Two love Mountains. This. Okay. <clears throat> it's an old Gretsch tenor guitar, Dobro. 
Oh. Which is four strings. Like. And I put all four strings in the same tuning. And so on the bottom string, I'm going bow, 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 bow. And I'm shaking it because they're so loose. And it being the little tin doily on it, it's a little small tenor guitar, but it's a four string. That you normally tune like a tenor guitar or a, or a mandolin or whatever. Okay. And so I just tuned it all the same. And it sounds like a sitar. It sounds just like a yeah. sitar. Yeah. Well, I loved how you opened that and gave homage to, to George you. Harrison that way. Well, I tried to that. put George's influences in the album without doing some of his songs. Like the first song, Between mm -hmm. Two Mountains, the solo in the middle is what he played in And I Love Her. It's dun da da da. Oh, okay. Dun da da da. Oh, yeah. All so right. if you listen to And I Love Her and listen to that, you go, wow, because you don't know where it comes from. But when, I, when you hear it in the song, it's familiar. Mm -hmm. And there's other stuff. I've had guitar players go, you put the My Sweet Lord lick in Don't Bother Me or something. And this, doo, 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 think doo, for doo, yourself. Doo, doo. Think for yourself. Think for yourself. Yeah, that's where I was catching the, yeah. the My Sweet yeah. Lord, yeah. which I love that song. I mean, I growing, I actually grew up for the first part of my life in Slave Lake, Alberta, which is north of oh, Edmonton. Yeah. So my my uncle owned... Great the, Slave Lake or just lesser, Slave Lake? Lesser oh, Slave Lake. Lesser. Yeah, Lesser Slave Lake. Only in, in Alberta, Canada would they have a Great, great Slave Lake and a Lesser Slave Lake. That's right. And I lived on Lesser and my uncle owned the what, Diamond Willow Camp ground oh, cool. there so when i was in the united states i was born in california but my parents moved back to canada when i was seven so we moved up to slave lake because my parents were getting a divorce and they needed to be around family to yeah. help out with us kids and stuff like that so we used to go to the the little local beach cobra cafe and we'd get poutine of yes. course our chips and gravy we yeah. called it at the time and always you'd be hearing my sweet lord playing and I, so that's that I riff couldn't, i couldn't I love do my riff. sweet lord because I thought it would be like trying to rewrite the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. I couldn't do it justice, so we just right. took the lick and put it in a different song, just to show that we were aware I of the song, it. but we couldn't do it any better than what George did it. I mean, so that was one of my questions. How did George inspire you instrumentally? Because, I mean, all these incredible licks that he came up with that you've George did what album. Lenny Bro taught me to do. When it's time for a solo or to do a guitar intro, don't go crazy and play everything you know. Mm -hmm. think of something in your head that's melodic because that'll be melodic to someone else who can also sing it in their head and when you're 14 and you can go dun da da dun or dun dun da dun da mm -hmm. kids do it on both E strings on a guitar they will buy the guitar and they'll buy the record if it's they, I can never play that and they'll never buy it mm -hmm. so the lowest common denominator always works and George did that in a lot of his solos and they were very melodic and well thought out that's why him and Clapton together were great because Clapton would just pull blues licks out of his giant vocabulary and George would think of something melodic to play that maybe George Martin would also double on a piano it's a very mm -hmm. melodic line so he kind of composed guitar solos like a composer he never really went totally crazy mm -hmm. everything was thought out and planned and consequently they are timeless to this day because they're part of the song. Right. Well, that's what makes a brilliant composer or songwriter is knowing yeah, when I to agree. have those spaces in between. To have the spaces, and, yeah. and you have that knack. I mean, you were classically trained in violin, yeah. and that resonates with the, the melodies that you... And all you play in violin is lead. It's a lead instrument. So I went right from violin to lead guitar. <laughs> makes sense. Like the same single note thing, right? And so. then you went into lead vocals, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. by accident. And um, I just want to point out, I love that you called your work uh, the Prairie Rock Band or Prairie Rock Music back in the day. I actually hadn't heard that term prairie before. Prairie Fire, Prairie Rock, Wheatfield Soul. They called us that as a name, a, a derogatory name. We had the hit shaken all over. Burton Cummings joined the band. We'd go to Toronto and play. And they had all these bands that would copy James Brown. All guys in red suits, a guy jumping around three or four horn sections, B3 Hammond, Oregon guitar player, and they'd be doing James Brown and all that R&B from Wilson Pickett, all that stuff from that mm -hmm. era. And we show up and play our brand of country rock, pop, Beatles, Shadows mixture, and they call it Wheatfield Soul as a joke. Mm -hmm. Here come the Wheatfield Soul guys like we had <laughs> no soul. So we I figured, what the hell? We call our first album Wheatfield Soul, had these eyes, the first Canadian million seller by a rock band on that, and suddenly We Field Soul became a really great, cool name. Mm -hmm. There's a I hockey team cool. in Brandon, I think they're called the Wheatfield Soldiers. They call themselves Soldiers, Love it. spelled S O U L J E R S, Soldiers. Love so it, it. Pretty, became a cool name. How unique. So now you, I want to talk a little bit about your guitar collection because I've heard you have a very large You've guitar. You've got to collection. see what I got now. 
Yeah, I want to come and see. I really do. You should take um, pictures. I would love to. Uh, and I, I, I've actually recently been speaking with uh, Fred and Dinah Gretsch. And so I understand you sold something like 385 Gretsch 385 guitars. Gretsches. Well, some of them are basses, some are amps. Maybe 300 Gret Gretsches. Maybe two dozen basses, some amps. A Gretsch accordion. A Gretsch organ, which is weird. Incredible. Gretsch wow. mandolins. Everything I found that was Gretsch, it was my obsession. Are you and, still playing a Gretsch? You still play one? Uh, not on stage now because they feed back. But when <laughs> uh, when we're here doing By George at the Troubadour, okay. uh, I just got the George Harrison Country Gentleman Beautiful. and the Rock Jet. And we've also got our own Gretsches. We'll be playing them okay. here at the Troubadour. Nice. Well, Fred has agreed to write a piece for my next book I'm oh, really good. excited about. Yeah, actually, Seymour Duncan's writing the foreword, and oh, Fred cool. and Dinah are going to write Great. one afterwards, so I'm really excited about that. What was your first guitar? A Harmony, $34.95 from Sears Catalog. We yeah, because us Canadians always ordered everything from the Sears from Catalog. Sears, just as yeah. most of Mid-America did, and all the harmonies were made in the Harmony factory in Chicago. And then they did a deal with Sears, and they were called Silvertone, but they were mm -hmm. still a harmony guitar. And mine was just an F-hole with an arch top, $34. And I played it for mm, a couple of weeks to learn some chords. And it's that then it's like Bye Bye Love and mm -hmm. Hound Dog and Elvis, okay. you know, That's All Right Mama, stuff like that. And then it was time to play lead. And you couldn't really get anything out of this guitar. So I went back to the catalog, got the was then called a silver tone or Dan Electra they were called mm -hmm. here okay. uh, but still made by Harmony and uh, the single cut black guitar Jimmy Page has a double cut one that I still have to this day I used a lot of it on the By George album there's a very strange you used it on the By George yeah, album yeah there's a very wow. strange history to that guitar that I've had it since I was 16 I've never had to do anything to it incredible it's made out of pressed wood it's <laughs> hollow it's got the lipstick tube pickups, which are from real Max Factor lipstick, leftover <laughs> lipstick that the, Dan Armstrong, who designed the guitar, put the magnets in. Very um, cool. Amazingly, he got a deal on the fretboards, which were rosewood, which are double thick any other rosewood on any guitar. So you look at these old Dan Electros, the rosewood fretboard on it's about that thick. Well, you can't bend rosewood. Mm. It doesn't bend. It's like a eucalyptus. It's just a straight tree. You can't do anything to it. If you bend there to shape it, a year later it goes back to the original shape. It's like a Nerf thing you twist, it pops back to the original shape. So uh, there's something great about that guitar. Well, that one, I've I would since really got like three to more photograph like it. it. Okay, well. Now they've gone from, I bought it mine for $74. Now they're like at a zero, seven, 750 bucks. Some of them are $1,500, the Jimmy Page one, which is the double cut, that he still mm -hmm. plays on stage. Wow. And because it's hollow, you can just, I could sit here with it and play it, and it's almost like an acoustic. Because it, it re has a resonance to it. It's not like a Strat or a Tele that's hard wood. This is hollow guitar in between. What did you write on that guitar? Can you remember? Anything special you wrote and recorded on that guitar? I wrote songs you wouldn't know. One was called Randy's Rock. Where I took every Chuck Berry beginning from Johnny Be Good and Old Carol and all that and just put it all together and mm -hmm. called it Randy's Rock. Well, of course, it was plagiarism, so that never came out. <laughs> Um, then my next guitar, because of Lenny Bro, was to getting the big orange Chet Atkins 6120, mm -hmm. which Eddie Cochran played and, and uh, Chet Atkins played. And it was like a really incredibly great rock and roll guitar. Dwayne Eddy had one. And I had the Dwayne Eddy model. And that's the one that was stolen from me. Uh, Did you get it back? Which I played on Shake on All Over okay. and Taking Care of Business. I never got it back. Mm. But that was before internet. And I used to get mailers from like Gruen Guitars in Nashville or Norman's Rare Guitars in LA every month with a list of guitars that were trade-ins. And I'd call them and say, what does this look like? Well, we got a Gretsch and nobody wants a Gretsch. So we gave the guy a buck and a half. So if you give us 250, we want to make a hunt on it. We'll send you this silver Gretsch or this orange Gretsch. So I started to get them looking for mine. Mm. Never got mine. Ended up with a dozen, two dozen, 50, 100. It became my midlife crisis was finding <laughs> my Gretsch and could never find it. I think I saw it in a video once, the Thompson Twins. The guy played it in a song called Doctor, Doctor, and it looked like my Gretsch. Did you contact him? No, I didn't know how, but I knew it was my Gretsch because Gretsches were made out of plywood. So you could tell the top of an orange Gretsch, beautiful grain, because plywood has beautiful grain in it. 
And whenever there was a knot in the wood, they would punch it out and put a thing like a teardrop that would fill that. So mine had a little knot right by the master control, which looked like a dark orange spot because beautiful orange guitar. And so that was the distinctive mark on my guitar because all Gretches were this beautiful thing. My had this, what you'd call a little flaw, but the size of a dime. And I saw it in the Thompson Twins video and I looked at it and it's got this extra dark orange spot. So the Thompson Twins were playing Vancouver and my road manager at the time in Vancouver would go and do the stage drinks and backstage, you know, mm -hmm. make the dressing room for the guys. And I said, um, here's my original picture of me with a guitar. Here's my original insurance policy. Here's the report when it was stolen with the RCMP in Ontario. And I want you to go when this guy with the blonde hair pulls it out at the sound check, Thompson Twins at the, at the Dome in Vancouver. And I have a friend in the police in Vancouver. I don't want the guy arrested. He always he didn't steal it. He wasn't no, in Toronto. No, he bought it from somebody. He bought it. And I'd like to find out what he paid and pay him back or pay him double. This is my tool. This is my guitar mm -hmm. that I wrote these songs on. So Marty Kramer, who's like my road manager, waits till they do their sound check and they don't bring out an orange Gretsch. So he kind of goes up and he says, you know, guys, I saw your video, Dr. Doctor, playing a beautiful orange Gretsch on that. I just wondered, could I see it? And the guy says, we wouldn't bring that on the road. It's too beautiful and too rare. Somebody would steal it. Oh, geez. So I never got it. So my big confrontation there never happened. Oh, too So bad. somebody said, why don't you call this guy? Yeah. I don't know, even know his name, but he might out. still have it. I can't believe I can't think of the guitarist's name right now. Tina. But the guitar model was a 6120, and the serial number was all sixes and ones and 20s. So it was a 1956. And so the Perfect. numbers were all mixes of 6120. So that's how I remember that. I might have to help you track that one down. That would be great. Track it down and photograph it. That's, yeah. That's like a mission that I'm on. You know, photograph him these. giving it back that's to me. That's right. All right. Well, let's not make that a project. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to touch on um, Smashing Gear. Because when you came back from the UK, you were influenced by the Who, and you awakened, enlightened the Canadian scene by smashing a few guitars. We were so desperate when we went to England in 67 and came home broke, forty or $50,000 in the hole, which in 67 was a big amount of money. You could yeah. add a zero to that. It'd be four or 500000 this sure. day. And everybody confused us with the Who. So they would say, why aren't you playing my generation? So we, what the heck, we'll play my generation. Why aren't you smashing your gear? Okay, we'll smash our gear. So you get gear you can smash that's smashable, which is a Fender guitar, a Strat guitar. <laughs> you can drop it off a ceiling, it lands on the floor, you pick it up, and there's nothing to break, it's solid wood. Our amps were made by a guy named Garnett Gilly, so they were Garnett amps. And so we had spare bottoms made, and we would carry the black speaker cover on, uh, you know, the, the mesh. Mm-hmm. And we just had holes in it. And I had these fuzz tones and Herzogs that made all these feedbacks that I'd turn up full. And I would just go and take the guitar and just smash it into this fake speaker bottom, not my real one, to direct the real oh, speaker. Okay. And rip it up and smash it and kick it. And the end of the day, we'd pull it off, staple gun some new <laughs> on for the next night. So we didn't really smash our stuff. That we couldn't biz. afford it. But the Who did smash their stuff. And it took them, I think, three and a half to four years to break even. They just wow. had a guitar bill that was, you know, in the... Tens and thirties and fifties. So the guitars of never really got destroyed. No. Okay. But they got Pete Townsend destroyed his. I never destroyed yeah. mine. Yeah, and Jimmy destroyed his. Yeah, sure did. He burnt his. You know, four of his guitars will be in my next book. Jimmy oh, really? Hendrix. Yeah, I got his white Woodstock Strat that I photographed at the Experience Music Project in Seattle. I got then, offered to buy that and didn't. Ooh. And then, well, Paul Allen got it. He, I'm sure he paid dearly oh. for it. Yeah. Well, I could have got it for two weeks' salary. A guy named Woody Woodsman, who's a drummer from Spiders and Mars, was playing at my studio. I had a studio in Linden, Washington, where I lived just over the U.S. border, south of Vancouver. And he said, uh, do you want to buy Hendrix's whole rig? His Fender, his uh, Marshall stack, his white guitar, and his Roger Mayer football. I said, what do you mean? He said, my brother was his roadie for two months and never got paid. And Jimmy flew back to London. He's gone. And I think Jimmy had passed away by then. And he's got it at his house. And all he wants is his two weeks' salary. Well, how much is that? Well, it's 1,200 pounds. Sorry, I don't have 1,200 pounds. I was broke at the oh, time. I didn't buy it. Wow, damn. So that probably went to someone who went to Paul Allen. It probably went around quite a bit. Yeah. And then Paul Allen eventually ended up with it, which is great because it's in very yeah, good yeah. hands and it's, it's treated very home. well. Yeah, I got yeah. the white glove treatment when I went to photograph it. Oh. I wasn't allowed to touch it. And they oh. had their white gloves on and they moved it around for me. And I, I got a special purple velvet background to lay it down I tried to sell Paul Allen my Gretsch collection. I knew he was a guitar you mm -hmm. know, aficionado. I never, ever got a reply from him. Hmm. 
Then I got a call from Fred Gretsch saying, everyone has a museum and you own mine, so I need to buy mine from you. So yeah. that's the perfect home for them, yes, you know, is. the Gretsch Museum. So let's talk about a little bit more about your your new album. Uh, we did touch on, you know, I love that you could put the sitter on your on your original song Between Two Mountains and and that jazz sound that you have going on. That's like a modern chill house that I I think that uh, it, what's brilliant about not your just amazing history of, of music and composing and producing music that you're on top of the new generation still like you've got your pul- your hand your finger on the pulse of what's happening now because that song you wait it's going to be picked up I hope and so. used by I a DJ I want to see Bruno Mars or Justin exactly, Timberlake do that Exactly exactly yeah. I mean it might even be worth reaching out to him and go FYI you know yeah. this is out there yeah. because that's when I heard that I'm like he is so on top of his game yeah. putting coming out with that so um I tried so to reinvent awesome. every song and not just do a copy of the Beatles. Because when I was putting this album together, I would Google if I needed someone, iTunes, and get it by the Hollies. It would be the same as the Beatles. Mm-hmm. I'd listen to half it and I'd go, well, I know what the back half is. It's the same thing. And I didn't want my album to be ho-hum, another guy trying to copy guitar that gently weeps. So I did that song, like the Who doing, I could see for miles, three power chords, and not honoring all the chord changes, but making it our own. And then you change the odd note that you sing and you make the song much more powerful. Just like in Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth, the original George one is probably 12 or 15 chords. Mm. And we did ours with three power chords, mm-hmm. like the Who. And it, I think it makes the song much more of a chant, of an anthem, like a mantra, mm-hmm. and it's much more powerful. We end and the George show with that, love that. And the audience is in like tears when we do that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I noticed that a lot of the tracks are from the concert by George. Yes. Um, concert by George and um, so it, I thought to myself what a challenge it was f- must have been for him to rearrange these songs after they were a lot of them were played at concert by George how do you top that you right. know and so with gu- my guitar gently weeps and you've got Walter Trout on that track um, and it's just brilliant the arrangements and the guitar work well I met him at the Jeff Healy 50th anniversary birthday party I met Walter Trout uh, Sonny Landreth Oh, he's and, amazing. And um, Walter and I hooked up. He came and played the Toronto Jazz Festival with me last September. We opened the uh, Masonic Temple, which had been closed for concerts for years. Zeppelin, I think, was the last band to play there in 70-something. So we opened that. It was really great. And then I sang a, and played guitar and song on Walter's album that just came out last year. That came out at number one on Billboard. And I contacted him saying, you owe me this favor. I met his wife, Marie, who's just a wonderful blues expert. She's written a great book on the blues. And he said, I'm on tour. Just send me the track. So I sent him an MP3. He puts it in his little laptop, gets his roadie to bring the Mesa Boogie up to his hotel room somewhere in Amsterdam, (laughs) turns the Mesa up full, puts on headphones, plays this thing once. But I took the ending of Guitar Gently Weeps and added two minutes of us repeating it so he could just play and play. And I was going to comp the solo at the end and just... Pick out the good stuff. He played so amazing. I left the whole thing. So the song's like six minutes long. His solo starts at the end. I let him run the full two minutes. And that's kind of like Hendrix landed in the studio. Eric Clapton showed up mm. and played the cool. whole ending. It's like it's totally it's a beautiful unplanned. Fade out. And the way he the way it composes fades out and end. builds up, it's exactly what I wanted him to do. But I didn't ask him to do that. I kind of hoped and prayed and knew he would do that. Because I've been driving around England, Germany, or England. I hear this song on the radio where the guitar solo starts and it's somewhere around, it's an A, it's in the fifth fret, and then it's higher and higher and busier and busier. And he plays stuff, I know, and, but the solo goes on and on and on, like uh, like a Coltrane or a Miles Davis thing. The guy's just taking you on a trip. And so instead of a 12-bar, he's doing like a 112-bar solo or 200-bar solo. And when he did that on the end of Guitar Gently Weeps, I just called him and said, Walt, that was just the most incredible thing. Um, he and I have had health issues. We both passed away, died a few times. <laughs> so I said, every time I hear the ending on that, I think of between the two of us, we've died three times each <laughs> and been re- revived again with a <laughs> kind of thing, right? Like he had a kidney problem and I've got a pacemaker now. But I think of these two dead guys who are alive <laughs> playing the end of that. It brings me to tears every time I hear the end of that because in the end, I kind of quiet him a bit and I do a Clapton, do, 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 do. Kind of singing Clapton thing like American Woman or mm-hmm. I Feel Free, and then I pull myself down. And he comes in faster like Hendrix. So in a way, we, it's like Clapton and Hendrix. Clapton played slow hand, more hanging on to notes, 
and Walter plays faster stuff like Hendrix. So the ending of that song is one of my favorite moments. It's just on a the beautiful album. combination, and I enjoyed it very much. As I think also, Here Comes the Sun is a masterpiece on the album. Thank you. On- <laughs> Believable. That's a song I took that was a major key and made it minor. And that allowed me to go to all these chords Lenny Bro showed me to do a key change in the middle. And then the trick was, after the key change, how do I get back to D minor again to do the second verse of the solo? So that little transition, here comes the sun, do, 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 here comes mm-hmm. the sun. And I said, it's all right. It's all right. Those That little chord thing there, it took me three months to try chords that... I could play well, sing the same melody line over, and that would end in an A or an A something to get me back to the D minor, or end in an F to climb down to a D minor. And magically, I woke up one night and thought, I'll try these chords and try it, and it fit. I sent it to my band. They said, this is amazing. You could tell the night before I saw the Gypsy Kings. Fantastic. Because we get to the end of that. There's a mic live in the studio, Mm -hmm. and it ended. We were just listening to the the electric mix. Okay. And I had a guitar, and I started to go, da-da-da-da-da. And I said, come and play. So Mark's, Mark's just hitting a stool, and we're all singing live there. The tempo changes, but we all did that ending. Ella Gypsy Kings, and I go, here comes. The, so let's play this Gypsy Kings thing, and let's sing Here Comes the Sun over it, and let's see what happens. And we did. That's where we're all laughing at the end. It's a one take, and we're all laughing like, what was that? Let's hear it back. And we did, so we, we trimmed it up a bit and shortened it because it went on for like seven or eight minutes. So that's kind of the end well, of Here Comes the it's Sun. It's absolutely brilliant. And Thank I hope you. that we're going to get to hear that when you come back in July. You're we are. We're back playing to July. At the, uh, and Walter Trout can't come. He's on tour. Okay. But Philip Sace, who I also met at the Jeff Healy thing, who's the great new Stevie Ray Vaughan, Toronto kid, who played with Jeff Healy for 89 years. He's here and he's going to join us Fantastic. there. And maybe another special guest or so two. So tell us again when that's going to be. Uh, July 21st, Troubadour. It's my Every Song Tells a Story, where I tell the stories behind the Guess Who and BTO songs, how I wrote them. And it starts out with three George Harrison songs, and I explain my connection with George, how Winnipeg was like the Liverpool of North America, with Chad Allen expression that became the Guess Who, Neil Young and the Squires, Burton Cummings and the Devrons, Fred Turner and the Rockin' Devils, and how these guys are still rocking in mm-hmm. the free world today, and I still get to play with them and meet them every once in a while. I want to go to Fresno in a couple of months. Neil just announced he's doing... Two dates with Crazy Horse. Oh wow! Okay. No rehearsal. He said, "We're just going to show up. We know Thanks the songs." Thanks for that tip. I'm going to try to make that too, oh, and I'll yeah. definitely be at your show, July 21st, at the at Troubadour, the Troubadour yeah. in Los Angeles. It's a good two-hour show. Can't wait. With I'm a break really in the middle, I start with the it. Guess Who stuff, then we do a little break. I come back and overdrive with the with the BTO stuff, and interspersed through it all is um, the George song, and in the George song, and American Woman and stuff. We're having special guitar players. The only one I could tell you now is Philip Sace. Okay. Well, the other I'm one's going really to be a shock. really looking forward to it, Randy. And thank you so much. I'll tell you the so other much. one when we're off, Mike. Okay. Thank you so much for spending this thank much you. time with Thanks. me today. Yeah. Thank we'll you. see you. This is pretty incredible. So you got this. You got your book bag. You got the book. Wow. Thank you. And you got. An I extra- want more interviews like this. <laughs> you have a second, like Christmas. Yeah, you got your your another set of prints plus your Go Diddly guitars in there. Wow. So if your manager wants a print now, you can maybe. So I can trust have this him. too. Oh yeah, oh, that's all it is. Between two mountains.